I'm Musa Manzi, the professor of geophysics at VETS University. I'm also a director of the VETS Seismic Research Center. So my expertise are in reflection seismology. What we do is we work with the miners, we help them locate gold and platinum at the subsurface of the earth. Also we work with oil and gas industries onshore as well as offshore to locate the gas and oil reservoirs. We also work with the mining engineers to help them mitigate the risk in deep underground gold mines. We also work with engineers such as civil engineers as well as structural engineers for building purposes. So before you build any infrastructure, we do geophysics to map the subsurface of the earth so that you can mitigate any risk that might be associated with buildings. I mean, I often say I don't have a job because um, I often say I have a passion, you know, because I like what I'm doing. I don't really take it as a job. You get to travel. I like traveling. For example, I've traveled more than 28 countries, let's say since 2014 or so when I finished my PhD. And I've met a lot of people internationally and in terms of collaboration. So my favorite country is actually Sweden because I have a lot of collaborators there. Um, so in terms of what we do, so one of the reasons I like about what I do is that um, we're not only developing new technologies, but also we help save lives. As I was saying, for example, some of the work I did in 2013, we discovered um, how the methane travel into the mines and how it affects the miners that work underground. So we developed the technology that could assist the miners track this methane conduit and therefore prevent um, prevent the mine from explosion. So that's quite exciting. We love math and physics. The good thing about geophysics is that you have a physics and mathematics background, and then you've got a programming background. So it's the only field that puts all these branches of sciences together. And, and, and so we're able to go out of, the, I mean, out of the office into the field. We do surveys, we, in, we outdoors. We also spend a lot of time in the office analyzing the data. So you basically decide what you want to do and where you're going to be. You can be a computer geophysicist that just analyzes the data, but also you can be in the field whereby you're just a field geophysicist collecting a lot of data set. But the most important thing is that we're traveling a lot. For example, in the next few days, myself and my postgraduate students, we're traveling to Sweden to do a survey there for, for a mine. We're trying to locate the iron oxide deposit in Sweden using geophysics. So that's exciting. In reflection seismology, so what we do is we need a couple of instruments. One, it's a source that generates the energy. And then the other one is the sensor that is planted either on surface or inside the mine tunnel that records the vibrations. So what we do is we generate the energy in the form of seismic waves. And then these waves will propagate through the earth then they will bounce off geological features and they come back on surface and they get detected by the sensors. So what happened is, what happens is as geophysicists, we then analyze the time for the waves they took to go down into the earth and come back and then we get the picture of the earth. So the waves can be generated by two sources. One, it's a natural source, which is your earthquake. So basically your earthquake is when your earth or your rocks are critically stressed and then they release the energy. And then that energy travels through the rock in the form of seismic waves. The other type is when we use our own instrument, we actually inject energy into the ground using a seismic source, can use a hammer, or you can use a vaporized truck. And then these waves will propagate. So what happens is when they detect where the oil or gas reservoir is, they bounce back to the surface. When they detect a change between another type of a rock to where the gold or platinum is, they come back to the surface. Then what we do is we then analyze those waves and they tell us where oil and gas is, where water is, where gold and platinum and other minerals are. Then we get a 3D picture of the earth. So what we do is we treat the earth as a patient, like medical expect teach a human being as a patient. So that's what we do. So in terms of other fields, so we also use it um, in terms of infrastructure. So when you're going to build, you wanna check that your foundation is good enough so that if there's an earthquake, your building will not collapse. So what we do is we do geophysics ahead of time 
to identify all the fractures that might, that might get reactivated if there's an earthquake, that will cause a collapse on your building. So what we do is we can then show the engineers which areas are strong and which areas are weak. Therefore, they can build accordingly. We also advise the mines ahead of time where to drill and actually find the ore deposit. So in terms of working with other fields, so the engineers, they help us develop the prototype system, the type of sensors that we put underground. For example, in terms of what we're doing in terms of innovation, we want the sensors that will not be connected by the cable. So we're talking about the wireless sensors. The reason we're doing that because we want to speed up the time. It takes a lot of time to set the cables underground or on surface. It takes about half a day. But if they are cableless, you can just plant them, which means that the miners themselves can plant these sensors and be able to analyze the data in real time and see the danger ahead of mining in real time. So that's something that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world right now. This is something we're working on. So whereby the miners can actually place these sensors everywhere underground, and then they can actually monitor seismicity in real time. They can tell that five kilometers ahead, two meters ahead, three meters ahead, there is danger, we should not mine there. But at the same time, these sensors can be used to identify where gold is located, because when you're underground, you don't know where gold is. So these sensors could also map the structures ahead of the face inside the mine and tell you, you should mine this direction, not this direction. The other element is of the methane explosion. So if you're underground, there is a gas, and this gas can be explosive, it's methane. So when the miners get trapped underground, what happens is, it's because the methane has traveled from somewhere else and it gets into this open space underground, and if you have a bit of spark, it explodes. And then the mine, if there's miners inside there, then they will die. So what we do is we actually place these sensors and these sensors will be able to detect the fractures, the cracks underground that, that, um, that will be carrying this methane into those open spaces. So then you can be able to actually identify the areas that are prone to methane explosion areas that are prone to seismicity and also areas that got gold. So the same technology can help the miners find more gold because we need more minerals to meet the demands for mineral supply as we as the population is, keeps on growing. But at the same time, we need to protect the miners that are working in such harsh conditions. The same technology can be used, for example, in Guazulu Natal recently, there was a lot of uh, flooding and some of the houses actually got destroyed and we also lost, um, we also lost lives. So what we're trying to do is, is to actually deploy these sensors in some of the areas because you'll be able to detect some activity of the subsurface of the earth ahead of any disaster because then you'll be able to come up with some pre-warnings about the buildings that may collapse during the time of landslide as, as well as during the time of flooding. So those are things that we're working on. We're also working on R21 in Pretoria, where there was a huge sinkhole, and then basically the whole road collapsed. So what we're trying to do there, we place these sensors around to detect other areas that are prone to sinkhole formation, because which means that we'll be advising the civil engineers about areas that people shouldn't build on because they are not safe. So geophysics is used in so many ways in terms, of, um, in terms of applications. Also, we work with the government um, authorities in terms of locating water for communities that don't have water because the same technology, so what we do is we inject the seismic waves, they propagate into the ground, they detect where the water table is or where the water aquifer is and they reflect back to the surface Then they tell us actually where people should drill or should locate the boreholes for groundwater. So it's, it spans from one field to another. So we work with physicists, electrical engineers in developing the tech. We also work with the programmers, computer scientists, in terms of programming, in terms of analyzing the data because we work with big data sets. And then the geophysicists go out in the field and collect the data. So it's a very interconnected um, field in terms, of, uh, in terms of research. Yeah, so I was, I was I was raised in Guazulu Natal. Um, I was born in 
in a rural village called Redwe. It's like 60 k's from, from Devon um, towards north. Um, I was raised by a single mother. We were six at home. My dad passed away when I was two years old. So my mom struggled to take us to school, so she did her best to take us all to school. Unfortunately, my, my six uh, brothers and sisters, they drop out and I was the only one left at school, simply because my mother could not afford to pay school fees and buy a school uniform. I think because my teachers had seen something special with me, so I think I was lucky, not that I was a special child, that the teachers kept on coming back to my house and asking my mother to let me come to school because I was told that I was good in maths. So when I was at the high school, I think something special happened. One lady who was staying by the school uh, assisted me financially, so she paid for everything. Grade 10, um, that's when I think, um, I think I was very lucky. The lady was looking after me. She took me to Saturday classes because I was behind with my schoolwork. And that's when I discovered that if I wanted to continue doing science, I had to do maths, physical science, as well as chemistry. Then I found that the school where I was at was not offering mathematics and physical science. So I went back to the school and I said I wanted to do this subject and the principal said they don't offer it. And that's when I said I will teach it if they don't offer it. So they started in grade 10. So I opened a small class of six like six kids that were interested in doing maths and physics. So I was teaching maths and physics myself and, and biology as well. And then, so we went to grade 11. I was still a teacher up, all the way up to grade 12. We were all surprised because for the first time in that school, someone got 100% for maths. So I got 100% for maths and I got 98% for physical science. That opened doors for me to go to the university. But here's the problem, I had not applied because we were not told that if you want to go to the university, you have to apply. Took a bus to Johannesburg, then I got to the enrollment center. They told me I cannot enroll because I had not applied. But it turned out that the person who was working at VET was actually a friend with my mom's boss. My mom was working as a domestic worker. Then when I got to the university, it was the same thing because I didn't have a place to stay. You know, I was staying in the library, but when I was in the library, I spent a lot of time learning how to program, also learning how to speak proper English, because at the school where I was at, we were not really taught properly English like many other schools in rural areas. You know, we have the cool kids thing that if I'm smart in the class, it doesn't matter how you behave, but we live in a very complicated world now that your behaviors actually become your building blocks towards your career. You know, people will employ you based on how you behave and how you talk to people. So all these things that we don't learn at school, I've learned that actually they are the ones that decide how far you go in your career. I'm not saying I was a good child, but I think I learned to look at my behavior, at my attitude. I didn't make friendship based on geographical location, how people look. I made friends from different you know, skills from different environments. And that's why I travel the world. I've got friends all over the world, you know, who speak the same language as me. Some don't speak the same language as me. Some countries, you know, you feel unwelcome, but I still go because I know that bottling myself in one environment within the same group of people can only limit my potential. Growing up as a young child, there's quite a lot of stuff happening, which took me years to actually recover from. One of them is bullying at school because at some stage I didn't have shoes. I was the only child with no shoes at school. So I got bullied a lot and that made me drop out a couple of times. But this lady was, was helping me financially. She actually changed my mind because she was actually, I used to sit with her every single Saturday. She was telling me that if you don't believe what people tell you, you will be fine. You just have to believe in what you think you are, not what people think you are. And because I was a dark and skinny child in the class, so I, was, I used to be told, you're ugly and this and this. And then one day she told me, it's like, you're beautiful the way you are. And, um, and don't let any circumstances, you know, define where you're going and all this. So she used to motivate me quite a lot.